Um, I must uh, uh, thank uh, the board for inviting me to give this lecture. It's uh, a great privilege, it's a great honor, uh, particularly as I didn't know Dr. Deshmukh, but I did meet him once, a long meeting, and of course uh, admired very much the work that he was doing at that time. I had just come back from London. I was uh, enthusiastic about what was happening in the country, and Dr. Deshmukh's contribution was, of course, greatly valued and respected. Um, the one occasion I did meet him was, uh, for me, a slightly, um, shall I say, scary occasion. I was uh, looking out for a job in Delhi University, had advertised a post in a readership in history, and I put in for it, and was, I was invited for the interview by the selection committee. And I was I went there in all fear and trembling, not knowing what I was going to be asked and how I would cope with this thing. And uh, almost at the beginning, soon after the beginning of the interview, Dr. Deshmukh, who was as vice chancellor of Delhi University, he was chairing the selection committee, he turned around to me and he said, have you always from childhood up been interested in history? And I said, uh, no, Mr. Vice-Chancellor, in fact, for my last couple of years in school, I was very torn because I was interested in history, but I also had a great interest in biology. So, of course, he immediately thumped the table and said, ah, now we can talk, because he also had a great interest in biology. Both of us being amateurs, we had a lot to talk about. And I think at one point, the chairman, the, the, uh, member, the, the professor in charge of the selection committee, I think it was Professor Bishesha Prashad, if I forget, uh, not, he turned around to Dr. Deshmukh and said, are we holding an interview for biology? Are we holding an interview for history? So anyway, um, but I must say, I, uh, it's, it's one, one of the things that has remained in my mind deeply embedded, that this is a civilized way of holding an interview for a job where you ask questions about a totally different subject or discuss a totally different subject. But anyway, to, to, to come back to this evening, thank you again for asking me, and I will uh, say what I have to say and hope that it will make some sense to you. Um, the highly respected historian of modern Europe, Eric Hobsbawm, commenting on the relationship of history to nationalism, and given that history has become prolific when society nurtures nationalism, writes in his book that history is to nationalism what a poppy is to a heroin addict. And I think this is the most brilliant description of the relationship between history and nationalism. So I'm going to start with that, and I'm going to kind of have this at the back of my mind in much of the things that I'm going to say. I would add that the dependence has to be recognized and analyzed. Origins generally rise in status, when placed in the ancient past, there's a kind of extra status and legitimacy that, that uh, arguments get if you say, but it happened in the past as well, and the further back you can take it, the better. Um, origins, uh, yeah, they can then be used to legitimize what is happening in the present by assessing evidence and accuracy. And what comes from the poppy and enters the mind of the heroin addict conjures up fantasies about a magnificent past which fantasy sustains the present. Those of you who are familiar with the countercurrents of actual history as opposed to an imagined history in, for example, the India of today, or indeed might have smoked pot you will appreciate the parallel. Um, I shall speak this evening initially 
on the link between history and nationalism, leaving out the opium for the moment, and subsequently about why history has become entangled with legitimizing a kind of nationalist narrative history, which many historians are questioning. Even long-lasting cultures like ours have been punctuated by points of immense historical change. The punctuations have transformed our societies, and these changes are not arbitrary. Nationalism itself is one of these seminal points of change. By definition, nationalism should carry the entire population of citizens in a nationalist movement that makes for a new society together with its multiple requirements. So when I say the entire population, I am, of course, exaggerating, but only a tiny bit. Um, nationalism is a concept which, when it comes to be adopted, terminates the old social status, social system, and brings in an alternate society with values and structures that virtually revolutionize the existing society. Nationalist principles do not have roots in the ancient past. This I would underline. Because the new society that they give rise to is a response to current requirements and not those that have passed away long ago. So it's very much a product of modern times. Nationalism assumes that it brings about the uniting of communities on a substantial scale. And for the first time, their loyalty is to a new structure, namely the nation state. The single unitary purpose is the construction of the nation, that is, of citizens forging a single national identity. As, for instance, when the Indian national movement struggled to establish a state consisting of free citizens liberated from colonial control. But nationalism can have variant forms. From a, symbol, uh, from a single unitary identity to divergent directions and uh, divergent identities. In India, the divergence was of two nationalisms identified by religion, the Muslim and the Hindu, growing out of the colonial construction of India. These distinctly different nationalisms had diverse intentions. The, unity, the unitary nationalism drew in all the citizens and was anti-colonial, whereas the multiform nationalism segregated specific identities, differentiating them from the other that is singular. Their agendas differed and were tied to creating two fresh nation-states. What then was the kind of society that unitary nationalism was intending to build? At independence, when the polity mutated from kingdoms and the colony of earlier times into an independent nation-state, unitary nationalism was characterized by the necessary presence of democracy and secularism. Every person was to have equal status and equal rights as a citizen of the nation-state. Inevitably, democracy and socialism became essential to the rights of the citizen. These rights had never existed before. Societies of the past rarely gave every person the right to be equal or have a free status. The caste rules, for example, of the Dharmashastras underlined inequality and the absence of such freedom. And the same can be said for many uh, ancient texts in many parts of the world. Where a nation state comes into existence, the people cease to be subjects of a ruler or a kingdom 
and become citizens of the state. These are very two very different entities. Democracy is adopted as the model polity. This implies that governing the state is dependent on the wishes of the people who are represented in various state bodies. Power lies, therefore, not with those that govern, but with the agencies that represent the citizens. This is sometimes hard to believe. The judiciary, the legislature, the executive. The rules of government are not the arbitrary wishes of the ruler, but the actions based on constitutional authority. The rules and intentions of the functioning of the state are recorded in the Constitution. Nationalism, when it is singular, hopefully unites the people. A unitary nationalism, as with the anti-colonial Indian nationalism, other categories of specific and segregated nationalisms are not intended to unify citizens, but to segregate them according to identity. And this is a very fundamental difference in the two types of nationalism. Segregation means that primary status is given to the group that counts as the majority. The agendas of these two are distinct, and need to be understood as such. This is the point at which, when this happens, this is the point at which there is a turn to history. The legitimacy of identity and their history is claimed to date back to ancient times. And the older it is, the greater status it is supposed to have. It is, therefore, with the emergence of segregated, diverse nationalisms that there develops a difference, or in some cases, even a confrontation between the professional historians basing themselves on method methodological procedures in researching history, and those who are not trained historians, yet purvey a non-researched history. The intentions differ. The multiform group is more dependent on public support and it tries to reformulate history to uphold the requirements of the majority of the citizens. The others, not of that identity, may have lesser rights as citizens. History is crucial to the primacy of whatever the current majority may be and therefore has a role in nationalism, and for other reasons as well. In previous times, the study of and writing of history in various forms was left to scholars whose, uh, from whose midst came the professional historians. Slowly, there was a shift in history towards the social sciences, which demanded a training in reading sources and in learning systems of analysis and methodology. History is now a specialized discipline in which the proven reliability of evidence is crucial. And I would like to repeat this statement again and again because it's so badly needed. There is no catechism in historical study. So now, there is the history written by the trained professional historian and other views of the past projected by the nationalism of the many segregated groups, each vying for the primacy of a particular identity. The latter are questioned or rejected by the professional historian and are in turn said to be incorrect in what they present. Many who make pronouncements on history lack training in methods of research, but who nevertheless pronounce upon the past with full confidence, basing themselves either on hearsay or their own imagination. History to them is just a story. A story that I narrate, or you narrate, or anybody else for that matter, 
and making up stories is such great fun and very entertaining, as we all know from having told bedtime stories to our respective children. But when these stories are claimed as factual, then they have to be proved. And they cannot be part of entertainment, especially when they become central to the most influential of current storytellers, namely the media of every kind today. Democracy, which is politically crucial and a significant aspect of nationalism, is often used by non-historians as a slogan. But democracy is a recognized concept of modern times, as is secularism, and both are tied to the coming of the nation state. The historical change brought by nationalism is legitimized through history by insisting on its component having an ancestry in antiquity. Let me suggest a couple of arguments, uh, a couple of examples to try and clarify my argument. The 18th century French Revolution claimed links to Greek democracy so as to legitimize the change from monarchy to the nation state. Yet, there was an absence in Athens of the very concepts that moved the French. The free citizens constituted a bare fraction, if that, of the population of Athens. And the overwhelming majority of the population of Athens were slaves and aliens who had no representation whatsoever in or rights to governance. Imbuing governance with an ideal of democracy was an imaginative way of using the remote past to claim legitimacy for a revolutionary change in 18th century France. The revolution was seeking legitimacy for its call to liberty, equality, and fraternity by maintaining that they had existed in ancient times that these, as a trio, were unknown to the Greek city-state. This is a familiar formulation even in our times. Indian sources mention the centrality of the Ganasangha and the Ganarajya, especially with reference to oligarchies and chiefships around the time of the Buddha. Three citizens find little mention nor instituted methods of representation. The heads of Kshatriya families more frequently sat in the assemblies, and the Shudras and Adasas, despite being the majority, were excluded. The Panchayats of medieval times and the village assemblies, such as that of the much quoted Uttara Meirur, had a select, a very select membership. Caste society based on Varna and as described in the Dharma Shastras was a contradiction of democracy. The concept of the Ganasangha seems more prominent in the Buddhist text than the Brahmanic, understandably. Democracy necessary to a nation state came to India later in modern times together with nationalism and secularism and colonialism. The ideals of the French Revolution were beginning to be debated by a wider audience than just Europe. They were picked up in America and tied into American political thought. Democracy and representation were discussed with the upcoming of the nation state, associated with the emergence of the middle class, with the new technologies and functions of industrialization and the changes being introduced by capitalism. It entered colonial thinking when these ideas began to be debated in the colonies. European social theories of the 19th century bestowed an inferior status on the colonized. The theory of race became prominent 
in part to justify the control of the European over many non-European populations. To legitimize this particular type of control, the argument of successful conquest was insufficient. The innate inferiority of the dark-skinned colonized people had to be firmly established. Hence, the importance of what Europe called race science. Any culture that defined its, that defined its people as fairer skinned than another was taken as superior. Thus, the Aryan speakers referring to the Dasas as dark was read as skin color and therefore racial inferiority. The application of race to caste classification further clinched the segregation of the lower castes and the Adivasis. The controversy over the origins of Aryan speakers is presently also a contestation between the professed historians and those with, shall we say, pretensions of appropriate knowledge. The former locate the Aryan speakers as migrating from Central Asia in slow stages over some centuries, whereas the Hindutva theory, for instance, insists on their homeland being within the boundaries of India. Hindutva holds that both the Hindu and Hinduism originated in India, so they have no choice but to argue for indigenous origin. But defining the boundaries of India, as with landmark boundaries anywhere, has to contend with the fact of boundaries changing every century. The study of the Aryans associated with Vedic texts is a fascinating historical example of the diverse sources and disciplines that now are required for investigating such a topic. In the 19th century, knowing Vedic Sanskrit was quite sufficient. You didn't have to know anything more. Slowly, the additional disciplines started coming in. Archaeology in the 20th century brought fresh questions on the interface of two cultures, the Harappan and the Vedic. Was there an interface? That there were interactions was proved through the new discipline of linguistics, mid-20th century, pointing to possible Dravidian language elements being present in the earliest Indo-Aryan. The nature of this interaction requires further analysis to clarify aspects of cultural history, and it is very significant to the roots and beginnings of cultural history. In recent years, Aryanism has again become a contention between professional historians and others but the latter with a few exceptions. That the Aryan speakers were indigenous to India has been questioned this time by geneticists whose DNA analysis of post-Harappan samples of the second millennium BC show strains from Central Asian populations. Historians working on the Vedic period have now to be proficient in handling genetic data as well, whereas the non-historians writing on the topic can, be, can let their fantasies run freely. In the early colonial period, India was said to be lacking in knowing history. Since there were no ancient histories as there were <clears throat> among the Greeks, the Romans, and the Chinese, the colonial power from whom, for whom history was the key to understanding the colony that they ruled, decided, therefore, to discover and write the history of the colony. The past of the Indian colony thus constructed would enable the colonial power to govern the colony the way they wanted to and, at the same time, claim legitimacy from a version 
that they themselves had constructed. Colonial historical scholarship had a base, basic orientation to the Indian past. One was to discover a history similar to the early European. But sooner, the other intention was to find a distinctly dissimilar one. William Jones, working in Calcutta, studied the Vedas and began to see similarities in language and mythology with the Greco-Roman. But some connections had to be conceded. But this was not so with other discoveries that followed, such as those of James Prinsett, who deciphered the Brahmi script, and Alexander Cunningham, who pioneered archaeological excavation. Colonial officers working in India were enthusiastic about these activities, as also were the Indian officials, for whom the vision created by this material was new and exciting. The two most influential persons working in England both declined to visit India to consult Indian scholars. They wrote from their study and reflection on the text. And these two were James Mill and Frederick Max Muller. James Mill wrote the first modern history of India, the history of British India in 1817. He started writing it in 1817, went on for three or four years. Much of it was his personal perspective of the history as it might have been. Mill maintained that Indian history was that of two nations, the Hindu and the Muslim, called them nations, quite distinctly separate and constantly in conflict. Indian history was periodized into the earliest Hindu period, when Hinduism was powerful, followed by the domination of Islamic rulers. Finally came the British, who controlled events in the third period. This periodization deeply colored the interpretation of Indian history. It has been discarded now by professional historians, arguing that its single and universally applicable ex explanation of religion as the prime cause of every major historical activity was untenable. It continues to be used by some who are not historians. What were the implications of Middle's history? The Hindu period was reconstructed from Sanskrit sources. The Muslim period ba was based on the Persian and Turkish chronicles of the Sultanate and Mughal courts. Despite the fact that there are pretty good Sanskrit sources available for this medieval period, Never mind, it had to be Persian and Turkish. The focus was on victorious invasions um, for the second period, victorious invasions, the destruction of temples, and the victimization of Hindus. Most chronicles written as eulogies to the rulers would tend to highlight these conquests, especially of rulers newly establishing themselves and needing that background. This is the kind of history that professional historians see as an attempt to whittle down every cause to a single one, religious difference, and ignore or minimize other causes. It was a travesty of the way serious history was being written, and something of a joke, really when compared to the careful inquiries, meticulous inquiries, that European historians were making into European history. For example, much of European thinking on Asian history initially put the study of Asia into a mold labeled Oriental despotism. Asian societies were projected as static, and registering no changes. The cultural pattern was like a pyramid, with a highly despotic ruler at the peak, controlling all resources through his administration, and those that labored to produce the wealth were at the base of the structure, 
and were immersed in poverty. The despot was only concerned with displaying his wealth. And the Asiatic mode of production was derived from this mode, as also some ideas of Max Weber and others. So it was a very influential mode in European thought. These attempts at explanations differed by contrast from the careful investigation of European history. It was not until the 20th century that European and Asian scholars investigating Asian data discovered a different historical reality. Mill's two-nation theory made an impact on politics in colonial India. The veracity of the theory was assumed and was not debated in depth as it should have been. It became the source for projecting two religious nationalisms emerging at this time, the theory providing political legitimacy. The segregated but confidential, but, 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 but conflictual nationalisms based on religious identities differed from the unitary anti-colonial nationalism. Secular democratic nationalism focused on the singular movement for independence, whilst the two religious nationalisms, Muslim and Hindu, divided the nation between them. The Muslim culminated in Pakistan, the Hindu is edging towards a Hindu Raj. The colonial projection is succeeding. From the historical perspective, we may well ask whether the division had evidence to support it. What was said to be irrefutable evidence of division by both colonial writers and more recent writers was that Muslims over the last thousand years victimized the Hindus and treated them as enslaved. Why do historians now question this theory? It's been around for a long time. It is claimed that this happened when the Muslims invaded India and came to power. The image projected is that of violence and aggression, of the one against the other. Now that the Hindus are in power, it is being asked, do they have the right uh, to avenge themselves in the same way? However, the historical sources reached, uh, researched by professional historians read differently and do not rejuvenate this view of essentially colonial historians. So let's look at it in a little detail. The dictionary tells us that to victimize is to make a victim of a person or a specific group of people, to cheat, swindle, and defraud them, or to deny them any freedom, or to slaughter them in the manner of a sacrificial victim. The professional activity of Hindus was reduced to a minimum. They were socially ostracized and, above all, forcibly converted. This was all being argued. And they also had to pay a tax as non-Muslims. Victimization is not unknown to most pre-modern societies. Let's be clear about that. I mean, however idealistic we may be about the past, Victimization was familiar. Those having access to power and wealth resorted to humiliating and harming those without either. In India, upper caste Hindus have been familiar with this for more than two millennia. The Dalits, lower castes, untouchables were segregated, and it was claimed that their touch was polluting. They were placed in a separate category of those without or outside caste, the Avarna. Segregation was practiced among all religions in India, although it is more often linked to upper caste Hindus. It seems that even on conversion to other religions and 
especially those that in theory observe the equality of all, this segregation was maintained. As a category, it may well have been the larger in numbers. And this is why we have Muslim Basmandas, Sikh Mazhabis, Dalit Christians, and such like. It cuts across the board of all religions. Yet, these are religions that formally believe in all of mankind being created equal. One difference, however, is that this practice was not directed primarily to a religion, but was linked to non-caste and the absence of caste status. Many questions arise that are fundamentally important to our society. Are practices of this kind directed less to particular religious communities and more to the large numbers outside Varna society? Are these practices on lesser social levels defined more by caste than by other identities? Significantly, in Sanskrit sources, Muslims are generally not referred to as Muslim. They, they use the ethnic labels. They call them Yavana, Pajik, Torushka, and a variety of such names. Since so much of crucial importance has happened as a result of what was rejected as religious antagonism and even victimization, let's just look at what were the actual relations between the two religious communities on a small scale at different levels. The Hindu and the Muslim and in the period of the last thousand years. Starting at the elite level, and the elite level is not always reflective of the whole society, but let's start with the elite. Uh, starting at the elite level of erstwhile Hindu royal families, quite a few remained at the highest social status. They remained at the head of the administration in their erstwhile kingdoms and were given the continuing status and title of Raja. You come across many of them in the Tur Turkish and Persian chronicles. Their income, agrarian and commercial, was sufficient for maintaining their aristocratic style of living. Traders from Arabia and East Africa, trading with the west coast of India, go back many centuries to the centuries BC, even before the birth of Islam. The extensive trade touched points along what is called the Indian Ocean Arc, the coastline that went continuously from East Africa up the coast of Arabia, across the coast of Gujarat, and then south along coastal India to Kerala. It's a huge arc. There was considerable familiarity among traders on each side, and Arab traders, after the spread of Islam, settled in the flourishing towns trading along the Indian coast. And their invading activities were in fact limited to a tiny part of sin. The main impact was quite different. Some Arab settlers married locally. This is what settlers often do when they arrive in a new place. Cultures intermingle. All along the west coast of India, new societies evolved as a result of this. Social identities and, identities and religious sects were a mix of Islam with existing religions of the area. This resulted in new religious movements, many of which are still prominent and very prominent in these areas. The Khojas, the Bohuras, the Navayats, the Mapilas, and various others. It also led to the employment of Arabs in local administration. The Rashtrakutas in the 9th century AD appointed an Arab governor of the region, they call him a Tajik, of course, uh, of the region of Sanjan on the west coast, in coastal Deccan. 
A Rashtrakuta inscription records the grant of land made to a Brahman by a Tajik, Arab officer, governor, on behalf of the Rashtrakuta king. He's the governor of the Rashtrakuta king. The revenue from this grant went towards donations to local temples as well as to the Parsi Anjuman, since many Parsi merchants were settled in the area. That's one way how in the, which we date the coming of the Parsi. The majority of officers at this level of administration were members of the local elite and therefore largely Hindu. And many of these officers continued in the administration of the sultans who followed. Appointing local persons to high office was a practice that went back centuries, providing closer control over local matters. This may well be a reason for Muslim rulers appointing Rajputs to high office. The Mughal economy was in the trusted hands of the Vazir, Raja Todarmal, and Raja Man Singh of Amir, a Rajput, commanded the Mughal army at the Battle of Haldi Ghati. He defeated another Rajput who was an opponent of the Mughals, Maharana Pratap. Pratap's army, with its large contingent of Afghan mercenaries, had as commander Hakim Khan Suri, a descendant of Sheikh Shah Suri. And one goes into these details, one asks oneself, can the battle therefore be called a Hindu-Muslim confrontation? Both religious identities had participants on each side in a complex political conflict. And it's that complexity that historians have to look at. Rajput clans had differing loyalties among themselves and also with the imperial power. And therefore, they fought on opposite sides. Both in this case, uh, um, both of them, uh, on both sides uh, in this case, were trying to regain ancestral kingdoms as well. The intervention of Hindu chiefs in the politics of the Mughal court was substantial. One instance that went on for a long period over more than a couple of generations was that of the Mughal relations with Bundelkhand. The Bundela Raja, Abir Singh Deo, was close to Jahangir and held one of the highest Mughal mansabs, ranks of revenue um, in, in the administration. And he was so embroiled in Mughal court politics that he was linked to the assassination of the chief chronicler and close friend of Akbar, Abul Fazl. I'm just trying to suggest that this is all very mixed up. Among the more impressive symbols of political power used by various rulers were immensely large inscribed pillars. You see some of them around here in Delhi. The Mauryan Emperor, Ashok, set up pillars in the heart of his empire, the inscriptions on which and uh, explained his governance and some of his policies. There are extensive inscriptions. It was a way of directly communicating with subjects. Later rulers, wishing to participate in the past glory, of the country that they ruled over, one of their wishes, would either add their message or reposition the pillar to borrow the glory of their predecessors or to assert their own victories, even though they were generally unaware of what the inscription said or who were the authors. No one really knew when they asked the locals. What was the meaning of the relocation of pillars? Was it celebrating the victory of the sultans? Or was it a link to the history of earlier times? The pillars were not destroyed, but carried, a long, uh, carried on for a long distance, but were carried for a long distance with great difficulty and relocated in pride of place. 
the whole question of legitimacy comes up again. One of the Ashokan pillars, my favorite, carries the stamp of an extensive historical statement. Currently in a central position in the Agra fort, relocated there by a Mughal, it has engraved on it the large body of Ashokan edict, as well as the famous <coughs> Prashasti eulogy of the Gupta ruler, some of the Gupta. This inscription cuts into the first few lines of the Ashokan inscription, suggesting that the earlier inscription could no longer be read. A few brief lines of Feroz Shah Tukla come next amid some graffiti, and the inscriptions culminate in a beautifully engraved genealogical inscription of the Mughal Emperor Jahangir. The pillar is a remarkable object encapsulating the Indian past used by three major emperors over three millennia and in three languages and three scripts. The object of pride in a continuity of great cultures. Thirosha was disappointed with that the text could no longer be read by the learned Brahmin. He had the pillars transported with much effort and organization to various important locations. One was placed like a surrogate crown, firmly on top of his citadel at Kotla in Delhi, where it still stands, and could once be seen for miles around. Was Ferocia anxious to link with the past? Because his mother was a Bhatti Rajput from Punjab. Or was he interested in displaying a stunning historical object that brought him attention as well. Among those that visit Kotla, uh, that visit Kotla, people of every religion, few know about Ashoka or Ferocia, but they stay for a while, quite regularly, and seek the barakat, the blessings of those that believe that there are spirits inhabiting the place. Significantly, the Sultans and the Mughals did not uproot these pillars or replace them with their own, nor did they destroy them. They relocated them. Were they also intrigued by the pillars as symbols of authority from pre-Islamic times? Did they possibly draw elements of their own legitimacy from them? Were they attempting to link their history with pre-Sultanate times? And what might have been the comments of the orthodoxy of both religions, the Hindu and the Muslim, on these activities? We don't know. The complexity of politics were not only the links, were not the only links between the Muslim rulers and the ruled. Marriage alliances were intended to strengthen social bonding. These were viewed as a means of easing political relations and winning allies. The Mughal royal family married into Rajput royal families of high status, since Muslims as non-caste aliens were referred to as blitch by upper caste Hindus. Um, did Rajput ruling families then lose face marrying into a Mlej household, even if it was the family of the imperial family, uh, the, uh, the imper uh, the, even if it was the imperial family? Apparently not. Was it a matter of pride that they were marrying up, as it were? There was, of course, no love jihad in those days. Memoirs and autobiographies do not suggest that these were forced marriages, since sociability among them on both sides was applauded. Court paintings of the imperial ateliers and book illustrations show many facets of the culture, brought by the Hindu wives, particularly the celebration of festivals, which appear to have been assimilated. Mughal aristocracy socialized with Hindus, yet Hindus of status looked upon this aristocracy, inevitably, 
as Mlet. They lacked Varna caste identities. An inscription from Palam dating to the 13th century issued by a Hindu trader of some degree of wealth describes Muhammad bin Tughlaq of all the Tughlaqs as almost an ideal king. But he concludes by saying, by calling him quite simply, a mlech. No trader would have used this term for a sultan in any derogatory sense, as that would have been the end of the trader. It could only refer to the sultan having no caste identity, and was often that is what it was meant to be. Low caste Hindus, as well as those that had no firm caste identity, could qualify as avaranas, as many did. Those regarded as untouchable and polluting were all at one level also lit. The 16th century text, the Sarva Darshana Sangraha, states categorically that the Shramanas, in which category are included Buddhists, Jains, Chadwak, and also the Turushkas. These are the Turks from Central Asia, the name that is always used for Muslims. They don't call them anything else, they call them Turushkas. Um, that all of these are called Nastika, non-believers in deity, and lacking in caste status. The Turushkas, the Turkish Muslims, did of course believe in a deity. They believed in Allah. But it was the wrong deity. It was not a Hindu deity. Depicting an altogether different social group, there is a rather unusual document of the early 17th century that provides us with a perspective on the life and thoughts of a merchant and his community at that time. This is the Ardhakathanaka, a lengthy autobiographical poem written in Rajbhasha Hindi by Banarsi Das in the time of Akbar. The author's grandfather was the Divan, the minister to Lodi Khan, the Nawab of Bengal. It presents a view of Mughal times from the perspective of the Jain merchant community living in Agra and Banaras, with extensive trading networks in other towns all over North India. Jaipur, he writes, alone has 52 highly active markets. What are we talking about? Problems with certain Mughal officers who tried to extort money from the rich merchants are mentioned in passing. These demands are said to have made not the slightest difference to the wealth of the merchants, which remained undiminished. The composition has detailed descriptions of religious practices, the places of pilgrimage, the rituals, the deities that they worshipped. One misses comparative statements on Islam or on any of the bhakti sects of the time. They're absent. Banarsi Das was briefly a practicing child, but he tells us that he very soon returned to being an ardent Jain, the religion of his family, and in which he was deeply read. A controversial but popular Jain movement was started in Banaras in his lifetime, and the Jains, it seems, were confident of their base. The other crucial historical sources, uh, uh, which remain largely unstudied in any depth, are the many inscriptions of this period. Some are official documents, but many refer to broader social life. In the 14th century, the Qutb Minar in Delhi was struck by lightning and required repairs. The masons who repaired it left a scatter of inscriptions all over, embedded at various points inside the minar. The language is Hindi, or occasionally very faulty Sanskrit, and it is engraved in the Nagari script. 
The dates are interestingly in the Samvat era, not the Hijri. I think that's significant. The name of the Sultan, who is the patron, is given. The dynastic succession goes interestingly from Tomar and Chauhan Rajput to the Shakas. The Shakas were central Asians of, this, of the, uh, the time of the Christian era who came down uh, as migrants and settled all over northern India. And it's a term that is sometimes used for Central Asian Turks as well. These inscriptions were composed largely by Brahman authors, so one is a little surprised at the quality Sanskrit. A few being mentioned by name. Those responsible for doing the repairs are also mentioned. The architect was Kaharda, the son of Devapala, and the masons were Lachman, Nana, Sola, Lola, Harimani, Gaveri, and others of that kind. They were all Hindu. The inscriptions conclude with naming the deity whom they worship, often Ganesh, and more frequently the particular deity of craftsmen, Vishwakarma, by whose grace, they say, the job was finally done. Invoking their deity clarifies that it was not forced labor, nor the labor of converts. Such inscriptions are not unique to the Qutub Minar, as they are also found on other buildings, including, interestingly, mosques. Let me conclude by asking the obvious question. Given all this activity of Hindus at every social level, and across time in the second millennium AD, what does this tell us about intercommunity relations? Shouldn't the educated Indians of today not mention, not to mention others, see the situation more clearly and understand it? As with fake news, fake anything creates immense problems of what are we to accept and what are we to discard. For us historians, studying the past means understanding how the past came to be through a logical and rational explanation. If we are to understand the roots of our culture, if we are to be the inheritors of our history, we have to comprehend intercommunity relations of the past, both the harmonious and the conflictual. Why have certain controversies arisen in our time? How do we analyze the evidence? Why is it crucial to separate that which can be proved from that which is fantasy or hearsay. By taking up the theme of intercommunity relations, I am not arguing that relations between communities identifying themselves by religion over the last thousand years or even earlier have always been amicable. Not at all. Earlier, too, there were problems that we tend to gloss over. The grammarian Patanjali, two millennia ago, says that the relations between the Brahmins and the Shamans was comparable to that between the snake and the mongoose. Or Kalhana, who writes in the 11th century that Hindu kings looted the wealth of temples when there was a fiscal crisis in Kashmir. Occasional inscriptions of defeated Hindu kings accused their later enemies of killing cows and brahmins. Do we check why there were situations of confrontation sandwiched between harmonious times or the other way around? Does the impact of peace or of aggression determine the creation of our cultures? Every religion proclaims that it knows the truth about life, 
and some even after life. Perhaps the dead do speak. As historians, we have to seek, to the extent we can, the reality that is often clouded by our surround. Let me finally return to the metaphor of Eric Hobsbawm. Should we let the relationship between the poppy and the heroin addict remain as it is? Or should we insist that the heroin addict should question the vision seen by her or him? Or should we reassess the quality of the opium? Should we go beyond and assert that in civilized societies, all knowledge is open to questioning? Thank you. Thank you.